one thing that I've been getting a little feedback from you guys on is that I make you feel more normal. <laughs> I guess me talking about how I feel abnormal, abnormal in this business, Abby Normal Brain, right? <laughs> makes you feel more normal because we all are a little crazy to be in this business. This business really goes against human nature. And that might be a good topic of discussion in future shows. But before I digress too far, let's let's talk some more about thinking like a trader. I really want to do some recap here because there's a few things I want to flesh out. So as I said last week, your attitude is way more important than your aptitude. And the reason I'm kind of beating a dead horse on some of these things is since last week, it's like I've bumped into a lot of people and I've had a hard time uh, explaining, explaining to them how important attitude is and things go up and things go down. And it's really hard for them to wrap their head around that. And the market doesn't really, well, first of all, it doesn't adhere to statistics. It's not normally distributed. So even if you were a very smart statistician, you'd have a very hard time in the markets. Now, as I said last week and often, a trader thinks of his stocks as employees, not children. So if you've got three employees that are busting their butt and one employee that is sitting on his butt, you would fire that one employee as opposed to children. You give them a second, a third, a fourth, and probably a hundredth chance, okay, <laughs> before you kick them out. And you probably won't ever kick them out and anything short of mass murder, obviously. But along the lines of this, I was thinking about it as you're also kind of like a coach. And I'm not talking about a coach of young kids where everybody gets to participate and have fun. That's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. I used to love going to my daughter's basketball games when they were much younger before it got serious and he cared about winning and all. But let's think about it like a professional coach. And a professional coach, his job depends on winning. And the way he wins is by putting together a team of the best players. And unfortunately, those who aren't doing really well, especially if they're lazy and not really working out. Unfortunately, he has to cut those individuals. Now, as I said last week, themes suggest what the market should be doing and the charts suggest what the market is doing. The newbie trader tends to think a lot in themes. If this, then this. And unfortunately, Beatrice, that's not how, that's not how it works. That's not how any of this works, he tried to say. A trader thinks in terms of what is, is. And often there is no logic to the market. So if a trader sees an uptrend, he sees an uptrend. If a trader sees a downtrend, he sees a downtrend. Now, traders and non-traders or new traders tend to agree upon uptrends. So the non-trader brain sees an uptrend, especially if he's already in the stock or other market, then his brain also sees an uptrend. Now, the non-trader, if he's in the market, especially when he sees a downtrend in his brain, he sees a market that might be at a value zone and due to reverse. Or as we talked about last week, he might have some price anchoring in his head and thinks that the price which was 100, or like Bitcoin was the example I think I used, was 60,000. Well, maybe it'll go back to 60,000. He also begins to use a plethora of other justifications and reasoning why the stock should come back. In addition to it being at low levels and a value, so to speak, they might say something like, well, the government is printing money and, and use some kind of scenario with how that's going to cause inflation and create this very elaborate reasoning, which makes a heck of a lot of sense. But unfortunately, that does not mean anything in the markets. Not all the time, or I should say most of the time. And you know, my favorite, and I know I've beat the dead horse on this one for those of you who know me, I was speaking at Traders Expo, geez, it probably was 15 years ago in New York, and I was very bearish on the energy stocks at the time. And as you know, I like to show live examples and what I'm actually doing. And then I gave the audience some setups to take home. And in the middle of doing all that, all of a sudden, one guy blurted out, and he sounded kind of like Henry Kissinger, what about the situation in Nigeria? And I'm like, what about the situation in Nigeria? And I was being facetious, and he thought I really gave a crap about what was going on in Nigeria. And he went through this long explanation, taking up my my time, as one of my friends says, one speaker at a time. It was kind of a one speaker at a time situation where this guy starts speaking. Oh, crap, there goes my time, you know? 
And he gave some really good arguments. And I don't know what it was. I don't remember what it was. I don't care. But basically, his point, I think, if memory serves, was that Nigeria was going to hold back on oil production or something. And oil prices would head higher based on this. It's like, well, that's why I often say, don't worry about the situation in Nigeria. What is, is. It's hard to talk about any of this stuff without quoting a little bit of Livermore. You should read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator if you haven't already done so. If it's been more than a year since you've read it, it's time to reread it. They say there are two sides to everything, but there's only one side to the stock market. And it is not the bull side or the bear side, but the right side. So as a trader, you want to think, am I on the right side of the market? And the easiest way to stay on the right side of the market is to have a place in mind where you would be wrong. And as I'm going to show you in a few minutes, that's not always at your comfort zone. Now, we talked about uptrends and downtrends last week, and I just recapped on that. One thing I didn't talk much about is when you have a sideways trend. Well, the trader brain sees a sideways trend. The non-trader brain often sees an uptrend. And to quote Ed Sokota, I, I thought I'd maybe go one presentation without quoting Ed Sokota, but it always finds its way into my presentations. In fact, I've said this so many times, people think that I came up with the quote. No, it was Ed Sokota. I think it was in the first Market Wizards. He said, a lot of people confuse intuition with into wishing. And... I can never understand in my educational business for years and years and years and years trying to teach highly intelligent people how to trade why they would try to make something out of nothing. After many years of teaching, I was dumbfounded by the fact that many highly intelligent people, doctors, lawyers, and automatic transmission mechanics didn't always make for the best traders. and they always seemed to deal with a lot of mediocre markets. They were into wishing they would see a market that was going sideways, but in their head, for some reason, they thought it was trending. And that's why I would preach over and over again about the net-net price movement. Where's the stock price today? Where's the stock price a month ago? Okay, where was it? And if it's relatively unchanged, then that's not a trend. And I kept asking that question over and over again. Why do these people deal in mediocrity? And as I've said quite often, a psychiatrist who is also a client emails me one day, and long story endless, she said, I think I have your answer. And the doctor, the lawyer, and the automatic transmission mechanic has to take whatever train wreck comes along. Otherwise, they would not be in business. They simply can't cherry pick or they can't wait for the so-called fat pitch to happen. I'm not going to show you to it, not going to show you this this week, but I have a doctor friend of mine. He sent me a picture of a woman's leg that was very disgusting. It was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. And it was a sore, and obviously she didn't wake up and go, oh, maybe I should get that checked. It obviously went for months and months and months and months and months. So the psychiatrist's point is they have to take whatever train wreck comes along knowing that they could actually make the situation worse. And in this doctor's case, he was going to have to operate on this disgusting leg, knowing that he could create more damage to the woman. But if he didn't operate on her, she would more than likely die. So a doctor, a lawyer, and an automatic transmission mechanic ha has to take whatever train wreck comes along. Otherwise they would not stay in business. Now, the reason that the trader sees the sideways market is because they think constantly about the trader's paradox. The only way to lose money is to trade. The only way to lose money is to put capital in the harm's way. The only way to make money is to trade. And that means putting capital into harm's way. So traders think, and I think, I think, is it Prinum non cheri? I'm kind of messing up that Latin, I'm sure. But it's a doctor's creed, first do no harm. And that allows traders to see the sideways market as they are. This morning I was doing my analysis of leverage ETFs. And I'm here anyway. I don't, I'm preaching against day trading, but I think it's okay if you're looking to get in a market as early as possible and ride it all day long. 
and the mostly hands-off and don't watch the screen all day. The flickering ticks, as Keller talks about, referencing Todd Harrison's quote. I think that's okay. And when I was doing my analysis this morning, what I like to do is write down on each ticker whether I made money or lost money, and based on the technicals I saw the day before and the action I wanted to take. Anyway, long story endless, this morning I wrote down zero for yesterday's action in Sox L and Sox S. And I actually felt good about it. Now, I'm not making any money. I didn't make any money, but I also didn't lose any money. And I think that's that becomes an epiphany for a trader is feeling good about not putting capital in the harm's way when capital should not be put into harm's way. Avoiding that intuition, so to speak. Now, traders don't think in terms of looking smart. They think in terms of making money. As I've said before, I somehow got on someone's newsletter list. I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus. And I was thinking about it before we're going live, and I think he was saying the same thing back at 4000 in Bitcoin. But I do remember back when Bitcoin was around 10000 he was poo-pooing Bitcoin. It's... It's fake, it's not real, it's made up, blah, blah, blah. And he kept saying this and saying this and saying this. And I saw it coming. And I'm like, you know what? As soon as this thing cracks, you know what he's going to do? He's going to say, I told you so. Well, in the meantime, it ran 600%. And I bet if I could dig out some archives, it probably ran 6,000% since he was against Bitcoin. Now, about a year or two ago, I came up with... A quote, I think it was something similar to this, but this is the best I can remember it because I didn't write it down. Bubbles go much further and last much longer than most are willing to believe. You can make a lot of money trading a bubble, or you can pontificate your brilliance so that someday you could say, I told you so. And I predicted this. I knew that would eventually happen. I have been on and off in webinars and other things where I interact with some other traders and in one case there was one guy bearish 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 forever right one day the market cracks he says i told you so and then actually over the next few days the market went right back up so was he wrong for that long just so he could be right one day and look smart i i don't know and again i would never throw anybody under the bus but i'd be willing to say that he either isn't a trader or he's a pretty bad trader of course, when we talk about bubbles, we have to talk about what Mr. Keynes once said. Markets can stay irrational a lot longer than you can stay solvent. Now, by the way, this bubble talk, many people who I've interacted with over the years have called out bubbles. But the bubbles keep going and going and going. I can think all the way back at least to the NASDAQ bubble. And these people made absolutely no money in the bubble. Now, speaking of trying to look smart in the markets and bubbles, many years ago during the NASDAQ bubble, somebody who I have the utmost respect for couldn't believe how accurate I was at, in calling all these trends, and he was just blown away. Well, he started to confuse the issue with facts, and I'm not sure why as a trader, but he started fighting some markets, the same markets that I was drawing big blue arrows, big blue up arrows in. And the emails got a little nastier and nastier than one day because I was long and he was wrong. He was short and he was getting hurt really bad. And he said, you're nothing but a trend following moron. And I was deeply hurt at the time. I'm a very emotional guy. And that's one thing that goes against me in my trading. And maybe I could flesh out the importance of taking a personality test. And we talked about that in last week's Week of Charts. So go in and watch that. I was deeply hurt, but then I came to realize when I just followed the markets and what is, is, was it an uptrend, was it a downtrend or sideways, okay? When I just follow the markets, not every day, not all day, but over time I, sent, I, I seemed to make money. But when I fought the trends, I lost money. And then one day I got to thinking, maybe I am nothing but a trend following moron. So I went public with that and said, hey, I'm a trend following moron. Maybe that's what I am. Got some buttons made, some t-shirts, probably to get some hats made. And I've kind of embraced it. As the motivational people say, I kind of leaned into that stuff, right? <laughs> 
spin it into gold. And to my surprise, many people who used to fight trends or try to make a trend when none existed emailed me and started calling themselves fellow trend falling morons or TFMs for short. And that just made me feel great. Now, when a trader is wrong, as we are often, he thinks in terms of ceasing to be wrong, not holding on with a chance of being eventually right. As a side note, right before I went live, I was thinking, my wife once said to me, not that long ago, you're often right, but early. Is there anything you can do about that? I'm like, no, babe, not really. And as I said in a big short, that's the same thing, Michael. <laughs> You just have to be willing to stop out and remember the old hedge fund adage, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Once you start quoting Livermore, it's kind of hard to stop. And he was talking about getting into positions and then realizing that he might be wrong. And he said, if instead it reacted, it meant that precedence had failed me and I was wrong. And the only thing to do when a man is wrong is to be right by ceasing to be wrong. Now, I'm not talking about sitting in a position for weeks and sometimes even months if it's not really doing fantastic, but your stop hasn't been hit, so that's what you're supposed to do. And if you go in and watch prior shows, you'll see I often talk about dead money, so to speak. And I don't believe in dead money as long as you're not stopped out. But what Mr. Livermore is talking about is when you're dead wrong, sometimes you just have to get out of the way. Thomas Huxley once said, give me the courage to face a fact even though it may slay me. I've also seen it written, give me the strength to face a fact even though it may slay me. So when that market is truly going down, and you should be out of the market because you're stopped out. Or worse, thinking about buying it because it's low, you need to see what is, is. You need to pray Mr. Huxley's prayer, God give me the strength to face a fact even though it may slay me. Now, traders think in terms of what has to be done, not what feels good. And one of those feel-good things is to pursue a highly accurate system. The desire to maximize a number of winning trades or minimize a number of losing trades works against the trader. The success rate of trades is the least important performance statistic and may even be inversely related to performance. Now, what Mr. Eckhart, I believe, is alluding to some sort of systems where you make a little bit of money, a limited amount of money, and your risk is much higher. If you want a very brief but brilliant career on Wall Street, go in and sell options and go or go in and trade pure reversion to the mean trading. You're gonna make good money for a while, but as I often joke, that'll work until it don't. The market likes to lull you into false security of high success rate techniques, which often lose disastrously in the long run. The general idea is that what works most of the time is nearly the opposite of what works in the long run. So if you're taking little tiny profits and taking huge losses, you're going to probably do okay because most of the time the market's going to move enough for you to get that little tiny profit out until it does it. Or if you're selling options on a pure sense without hedging of some sort, which makes it way more complicated than it needs to be then you are going to do really well until you blow up. What feels good is often the wrong thing to do. Trading is very unnatural. It's not like life where you have to take whatever train wreck comes along, right? You have, But in trading, you can pick and you can wait and you can be patient. And in life, you have to take action. In trading, you have to be patient. So along those lines of what feels good, Traders don't think in terms of what makes them comfortable. They think in terms of what's required. I had to get out of some positions yesterday. I had to put some really big losses on the book. And I wasn't happy about doing that, but I had to do it. I didn't want to hold and hope and watch them get worse. Now, one thing along the lines of comfort I was thinking about this morning is we put on this position and it had 23% risk. And in the past, I've received emails from people, 
I can't risk 20% on a trade. It's like, okay, so I'm not going to take that trade you recommended. Well, what they fail to realize is just because you're not willing to accept that 20-something percent risk, in some cases, maybe even 30% risk, especially in some of these lower price issues that we trade, is that that's what the stop calls for. There was a popular method. I'm not going to throw, again, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus. But there was a popular method years ago that said always use an 8% stop. Well, that's like saying that I should wear a medium-sized shirt, something that my fat arse hasn't done since I was five years old. I thought about it before the show. I need to find like a medium-sized shirt and put it on. <laughs> show you how gross that really would be. See if I can discuss a few of you, right? I think I should one day. Anyway. This is what the stock call for, but keep in mind with my methodology, if you go in and watch a little bit on the money management, we compensate by trading fewer shares to compensate for the bigger risk required. And if you are truly a trader, if you're just looking at this chart, you take the scale out, it really doesn't look like the stop is that far away. In fact, it's not that far away from the recent lows, someplace you would expect the stop to at least normally be. If you're not willing to risk what's required on the trade, it's kind of like in Caddyshack. I ain't paying no 50 cents for a no coke. It's like, well, you ain't getting a no coke, you know? So here's a stock, and believe me, if they all look this well, you'd never see my fat butt again. <laughs> but here's this gentleman didn't want to risk 23%, and right now, knock on wood, it's up 655% since we got in. Now, as... I've alluded to throughout this presentation and many other presentations, a trader accepts the fact that trading is unnatural from a psychological and a physiological standpoint. And you just have to kind of plow through it and just kind of take a just do it attitude. Oh, this hurts honoring the stop, but I'm going to do it. And then you later find out down the road why it hurts so much. You, you read a little bit about neurology and, it's, and you learn that, hey, a negative emotion has twice the impact as a positive one. Oh, well, that makes sense. That's why I feel that way. And I can guarantee you the more you get into this, and as I've given presentations before, it becomes that peeling of the onion. You get further and further into it. It begins to unfold. It makes a lot more sense. Unfortunately, though, before the wise, W-H-Y-S, becomes wise, W-I-S-E, you have to do the hard thing in the meantime. Now, a trader thinks in terms of capital, and as I was putting this together today, I got to thinking that it's not just your actual capital, it's also your mental capital that's at stake. If you are not operating at peak performance because you have a bunch of losing trades that you didn't stop out of but should have stopped out of, you're going to have poor performance. As I've said before, walked into the gym once, don't laugh. I haven't missed an annual workout in years. But this was many years ago, and the receptionist who knew me, she said, uh, you know, what's wrong with you? What's wrong? <laughs> She's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, well, I'm in a bunch of bad positions. And then she said, well, Solomon, buy some good ones. And I'm like, oh, crap, you know, what the hell does she know? I have an MBA, right? Well... Apparently, she knows a lot more about trading than me. Many years ago, when I first became a public figure in the trading world, I was trading a bunch of these go-go momentum stocks, these NASDAQ stocks, and was doing pretty well, being a trend-following moron, as previously mentioned. And through being out there, I became friendly with quite a few people, and one guy in particular who was pretty smart I asked him, hey, are you trading these same stocks that we've been looking at in here, the, the, my list of stocks? And he said, no, I'm, I'm nursing a bunch of bad positions. Well, I'm not sure what that means. And according to Greg from Meet the Parents, oh, yeah, you can milk anything with nipples. Well, last time I checked, I don't think stocks had nipples. Now, all kidding aside, my point here is that he's hanging on to these bad positions, obviously he should have gotten out of, and that is consuming not only his real capital, but his mental capital and keeping him from being in good positions.